One possible definition of an artist is that uh, he or she is someone who continues to do as an adult that, uh, whatever it is they most loved when they were a child, you know. And there's a bit of truth in that. There was one book in particular that came out in the middle of my childhood, which was The Mysteries of Harris Burdick by Chris Van Olsberg, which was a series of very mysterious black and white drawings. And what I liked the most about this book is it didn't actually have a story in it. It was kind of encouraging the reader to come up with their own story, like a book of illustrations without text. And even now as an adult artist, I still think about that book a lot when I'm conceiving new work. My best time of the day is the morning. I get up very early. My working environment is pretty chaotic, in fact. There's a certain sort of chaos. I actually love the feeling of paint and ink and stuff. Inevitably, it boils down to me sitting in a chair with a drawing board on the lap. And the drawing board that I use, in fact, is the drawing board that, as a five-year-old, I'd sit up in bed and draw on. It's just, I'm so used to it. It's got nearly 60 years of scribbles on it. When I'm really involved in a project, I'll get up and get all, feed the animals and get everything done really early and then just get going for the day. And the day goes like that, like it's um, five o'clock before I know it. When people ask me what I do, I, I don't know that I've ever answered. Uh, I'm an illustrator. <laughs> But the only reason I make books is not because I want to be an illustrator. It's because I'm actually a bit passionate about the language. I love language that really turns me around. Or that makes me kind of think about something in a whole, you know, way I never thought about it before. And, um, or just that it's language like I've never quite heard before, you know. There can often be this misconception that an artist has an idea that's like an ephemeral, nebulous thing, a thought that's floating in air in their mind, and then that is translated into work. Sometimes that happens, but more often than not, the idea comes simultaneously with the work. The act of moving your hand to create the mark is the same as the thought. And um, in the past, I've likened it to um, a bird singing where the bird doesn't think about the song and then does it, the song is happening through the act of singing. I find it very easy or natural or intuitive to um, create characters and then imbue them with a personality. Once I've established a character, whether it's old Tom or Mr. Badger or Mr. Chicken, it's irresistible to create a story around them or a scenario put them in a context or out of context, like Mr Chicken in Paris, a ridiculous looking creature in this beautiful city. Some of my characters are people I know, but often when I use them, I don't realise I've used them until well after the books come out and they're not, they're not always their personality, it might just be the physical look of them. Someone will go, oh wow, it's nice that you've put Claire in that book. And I go, oh, so I did. But, um, and I think your, your sort of visual arsenal that you have at your disposal is all those people you know, so you tend to draw, that's what you draw. The relationship between dreams and waking work is very interesting. On one hand, dreams, like real dreams, are far more creative than anything I do in my waking life. On the other hand, they're quite lacking in meaning, I find. Emotional meaning is there, but conceptually they're all over the place. What I do like to get to is, is to work almost in the other direction. Start with waking life and the influences of waking life and our conscious thoughts and our struggle to draw meaning from everyday experience and sort of move those increasingly towards the atmosphere of dreams. So I love it when a painting of mine looks like a dream, but because it started off in a more conscious place and um, has an editorial process, you end up with something that has a lot of interesting concepts. In the books that I do, the words say something different to the picture. I never echo in the text what it does in the picture. And the combination is a third meaning. So in the old Tom books, Angela Throgmorton one day is doing the vacuuming and she hears a knock at the door. 
She goes to the door, looks outside, and there on the bay, the doormat, you see a basket with old Tom in it. But the text says there on her doorstep was a baby monster. So she picked him up and carried him in. So the picture is what the kids see. The text is from the adult's point of view. Kids, they're very brainy. Right from the word go, they know that what I'm saying is that this woman thinks of him as her child. She's adopted him. And that to me is the irresistible thing about doing kids' books, that I'm in charge and create this whole world kids are privy to without uh, patronising them because they have to strive a bit, you know. The process for me is whatever is easiest and quickest. So in some cases, it's easier to write Victorian street scene than draw it because um, it's a real quick sentence to write. And in other cases, um, if it's like a, a, like say an atmospheric effect, like a certain cluster of storm clouds, it's better to draw it. Writing just a cluster of storm clouds isn't going to quite get what's in my mind. So it's so about m accurate note making while the ideas are coming. And then I can go back to the earlier sketches and have a look and go, oh, that's what I meant to say, you know, and that's, that's the feeling I was trying to get. In. I think the hardest thing when you're starting out writing is just to write in your own voice to not write like someone else, and it can take a long time to come. The next thing is to write a lot, like just write every day. And I say to kids when I'm talking about drawing, you can't expect to never draw and then sit down and knock out a masterpiece. It's like playing football or playing the piano or ballet. You have to practise. You just have to do it all the time. I mean, I think when, when kids are first discovering language and images and how they work together, Kids, kids are so literate and alert and it's such a rich kind of mix to be involved in and try to contribute to it. So I love all that, but I don't actually think about kids at all, really, when I'm making a book. I'm, I'm just teeing off from the text. Uh, there are so many uh, books out there that are trying to teach kids all sorts of things. I don't know, you know, that are a bit didactic or that are worthy worthy, uh, you know, themes. I think some of it really underestimates kids and um, kids can work a lot of things out themselves, you know. And I just think, I think one of the best things you can give them really is beautiful language, actually. And um, great stories, beautifully told. Because if you can trigger, boing, you know, you've got no idea where kids might take it. You know, it's just wonderful. Don't tell them where to go. <laughs> Don't tell them where you think they ought to go. You know, just let them go. But uh, give them something wonderful to travel in. You know, I don't know, I'm, I'm sounding really corny or something. I just think a bit of beauty, a bit of, bit of, yeah, all that.